to give you a back backdrop on this portion, Baldock is the king of Moab. He's appointed specifically because there was lack of leadership. So although he was not from the royal family, he was appointed to be the king of Moab. And what was the issue? There were two giants, Og and Sichon, and they were the protectors of the nations of Canaan. They sat on the, on the border of Canaan, and any invading army, which even would attempt to enter into the land, they would destroy them. We're talking about they were giants. Not talking about somebody who's 15 feet tall. We're talking about heights, which went back to pre-Great Flood. One of them was able to lift up a mountain that was 12 miles by 12 miles. That, that's how enormous it was. Just as an aside, because it has realms, how he was destroyed. And all of a sudden now, Moshe goes, at last week's reading, he kills both of these giants. Sichon el Hamori, Sichon the king of Amori, and Og the king of Bashan, he destroyed both of them. All the members of the community were killed, and they conquered their lands. That, that was the conquest. But that conquest was not part of the conquest, which is what we call the land of Canaan. That's the Transor Jordan side. The midst of the conquest is after you cross the Jordan. So what happens? So the protectors were no longer there. They feel totally vulnerable. And it's clear there's no stopping of these Jewish people. How do you stop them? They're going to come and they're going to destroy everything. They're going to kill the inhabitants. They take possession. And when a person is confronted with an issue, a problem, and there's no direction you can turn, there's no escape route, you become consumed with that frustration and it evokes a level of anger because you can't deal with it. And there's no way to deal with it. And sometimes when a person reaches that level of frustration, we become very creative and we notice things and value things which we wouldn't have noticed until then. So firstly, he did his investigation. He did his due diligence on why the Jews were so successful. Why they were able, nobody could stand up in their presence and they just, wherever they went, everything was totally destroyed. And they were always the victor. Why? So they said that their leader was raised in Mijon. After Moshe had killed the Egyptian and he had fled, he spent 60 years in Mijon. This is where he married the daughter of Yisro, who was the, was the sheikh of Mijon. He married his wife, Tzipora. And evidently, it's not obvious from the text, Moshe Benu performed many, many miracles in Mijon. And they said, after doing the due diligence on Moshe, this man, his power lies in his mouth. In his mouth, physically, he does not do anything. If he makes an enunciation or any type of directive, it happens exactly the way he said it should happen. So his power lies in his mouth. So when, when Bullock heard this, there's only one other person who is paralyzed in his mouth, and that's Bilam. Bilam, the prophet of the nations of the world, is paralyzed in his mouth. So we're going to fight fire with fire. Moshe, his power lies in his mouth. Bilam, his power lies in his mouth. Whatever Bilam curses becomes scorched earth. That's a reality. Now, why, if you read the Rambam, to be qualified to be a prophet, even in the time of prophecy, you have to be at such a spiritual level, totally removed from physicality. Every moment, your mind is occupied with God. No distraction. Only then do you become a receptacle for God to communicate to you. And yet, Bilam, he's a man who committed bestiality. He's a man who suffered from megalomania. He was a despicable 
hateful person, pompous, anything negative you can say about a corrupted character person, that was below. And God chose him to be the prophet of the nations. Now, why here, he definitely had no innate qualifications. He should have been disqualified. He shouldn't even been looked upon. But he was chosen. He was a leader. All the heads of state sought out his counsel. And whenever they needed somebody to come to their assistance, he was there. And he cursed the enemy. And his curse was the kiss of death. So why did God choose Bilaam to be the prophet of the nations of the world? And God communicated him. Why? So the major says something interesting. Because at the end of time, there's going to be a serious, serious claim against the nations of the world. Because of the way they behave, violate the seven Noahide laws, many things. So they're going to come back with a retort to God. You know something? You know why the Jews were so special? Because he gave him a prophet, Moshe Rabbeinu. We had a direct connection, direct line with you. We, we were groping in the dark all, all these millennia. We didn't have a chance. God says, you know something? I'm going to give you a, a prophet as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. Even though he personally is not worthy to be a prophet, doesn't have the qualifications, I will give you a prophet that is prophecy as the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? Because the Pesach says, the verse says, there's no prophet who ever rose in among the Jewish people as Moshe. What's the inf inference among the Jewish people? But the inference among the nations of the world, there is a prophet who's the equivalent of Moshe Rabbeinu. And who is that? That's Bilam. So now, at the end of time, where they fail, so now, if they say, we had no prophet, you had a prophet. What did you do with the prophet? Okay? You commissioned the prophet to curse the Jews. Therefore, that silenced them. So the obvious question is, could you compare one to another? I have a thousand deep flawless carat diamond. And I take a piece of coal. I say, see this piece of coal? It's the equivalent of the diamond. You say, either you're blind or there's something wrong with you. I mean, how do you compare a thousand deep flawless carat diamond to a piece of coal. You say, the nation of the world, you, we, you, if you would have given us a prophet like Moshe, we would be, we'd be a different people. He says, here he is. So what, what were his values? What did he represent? He believed he could, he could manipulate God. He's a man who lived with his animal, with his donkey. Who's a man, an insatiable need for material and for acknowledgement. As it says in Pirkei Ovos. So is, is this a satisfactory response to their claim? You didn't give us a prophet. I mean, he took them down the wrong road. Instead of taking him to the base match, he took him to a brothel. Instead of taking him to a, a base match, he took him to a killing field. That's what he did. So how's this an appropriate response to what the need is? Now, what is the background? I mentioned this Gemara in the past. When God gave the Torah to the Jews at Sinai, the Torah tells us and describes the nature of the event. The mountain was billowing smoke. It was an inferno of fire. And the world was quaking. When the world was quaking, the nations of the world, they run to their prophet, Bilam. And they say to Bilam, what, what are we going to do? God is destroying the world. So he says, you're a bunch of fools. Don't you realize God, when he destroyed the world with the great flood, he had made a covenant, taken an oath with existence, he will not bring anything on the world to destroy it again. So what are you worried about? So they said, yes, that's with water. But maybe now he's coming to destroy it with fire. And that's why the world is quaking as it is. So he says, no, 
you bunch of fools. Don't you realize? Hashem owes Lamu Yitain. Don't you realize at this moment, God is giving this power to the Jewish people? That's what's going on. God brought heaven to earth, and earth, it has a finite capacity. And the infinite being came to, to existence. The world cannot contain his presence. That's why it's waking. So when they heard, Hashem owes Lamu Yitain, Hashem is giving his power to the Jewish people. The power of the Jew is the Torah. And the mitzvahs, they answered, Hashem Hashem should bless his people with peace. But once they realized that it has nothing to do with them, you know what they said? We're out of here. Back to the paganism. Back to the bestiality. Back to who knows what. That's where they went back. But the question is, after hearing what's going on, don't you think you should make a U-turn and go right where the Jews are at? You thought it was coming to an end. And Bill gives you a reading now. God's giving this Torah to his people. Every person who understood this should have converted immediately to become a Jew with such a level of clarity. And this prophet had, has the greatest level of credibility anybody in the world. Because they believed them. But the Jews, the non Jews said, but it has no relevance to us. I'm out of here. Okay. But he described in detail what was going on. God is not destroying the world. This is God's presence and existence giving his Torah to the Jewish people. What should have the Gentiles done? They should have said, we're giving up all our paganistic beliefs, our misbehaviors, our abominable everything to become part of God's people. That's what they should have said. But they said, no, you know, so we said it has no realm with us. We're going on our merry way, continue living this lifestyle we live. Okay? So what was the value of Bilam as a prophet who's the equivalent of Moshe Bain? The only one who had given that reading of reality at that moment was only Bilam. Nobody else could, could had a sense of what that was. That was his perfect purpose as a prophet. Once he fulfilled that purpose... They, now they have a choice. Either you go to the north or you go to the south. They chose to go to the south. They chose not to be impressed. As no realms does, we continue living our lives as nothing happened. That is the condemnation. I've given you a prophet who gave you clarity. And you chose not to, to go in that direction. So now that you're going to the oblivion, it's not because you didn't have a prophet. The reason why going to the oblivion is what he chose not to have any relevance to God. And therefore, unless you start doing something, it's not going to happen. You have no relationship with God. That was the value of Bilam. When the Jews left Egypt, there's a thing called Scorched earth policy. What scorched earth? When the invading armies are coming, the people of that country, they destroy everything. They burn the vineyards, they burn the wheat fields, they cut down the orchards, they destroy the houses, and they bury all the treasures. So at least when the enemy comes in, even if they're victors, it's just a location of desolation and destruction. When the nations of Canaan heard the Jews were coming and God preferred, performed all these miracles, they said, you know something? If they're coming, they're not going to benefit as an iota of what we accomplished in our lives. They went, they burnt all the grain fields. They cut down all the vineyards and all the orchards. Destroyed everything and hid away the treasures. Okay? We're about to go in. And Hashem says, you know, I promised my children they're entering into a land of milk and honey. There's no milk, there's no honey. Because they destroyed everything. And I promised them they're going to go into homes, they're going to find them overflowing with bounty. There's no bounty in these homes. They buried all the treasures. So what does God do? He presents us with a challenge. The Miraglim. And we fail. And the Jews are actually condemned to perish over 40 years. Shem says, no problem. I promised my children to have a land of milk and honey. 
they can be vineyards, they can be orchards. There's everything's be good there. The house will be overflowing with bounty. You know why? Because when the Jews were put on hold and we did not enter immediately, the Goyim realized what kind of mistake they made. Now they have to rebuild everything. The Jews are not coming. Fast forward 40 years later, the 40th year, and all the people of that generation passed on. Now, when they go in, they're going into a land which is flows with milk and honey, houses overflowing with bounty and bracha. That's the right time to go in. Now, we know that God can things happen in the moment. So what happens? So the nations of the world, they have their profit. They miss the boat. And we, when we were in, it was a fully well-stocked land. Bounty, wealth, milk and honey, everything was there. That's what happened. Now, this is the question. As you read the Parsha, the portion, Bilam believed that he could hoodwink God. And there's another question. If you see a raging fire before your eyes, I couldn't care what's in that fire, how valuable it is. Understanding you're going into a fire and you're going to be incinerated. Are you going into that fire? The moment you go into the fire, you, you, you've actually forfeited your life. If Bilam was a prophet, that means he had a level of clarity. Based on the level of clarity, how do you sink to a level that you commit, commit bestiality? You know, they say ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Bilam was not an ignorant man. If Bilam is a prophet, that means he had some level of clarity. With that level of clarity, how do you how do you misbehave to such a degree? It's a question. I used to give an example. A person has a tremendous desire for women. And he wants to have an illicit relation. Sexual relationship with this woman. She's attractive. Then he finds out that she suffers from a venereal disease. The moment he hears that, he's staying away from this woman like the plague. And it's an incurable venereal disease. Staying away. Because it's clear. If he wants to forfeit his life, it's not worth it for the moment pleasure to put your life in jeopardy to that degree. If Bilam was a prophet, he had a clarity, some level of clarity, but seemingly it should have been enough not to commit bestiality, not to be ridden and overwhelmed with everything which he despised God. You see who God is? No. Become a little docile. Calm down. It did deter him as much as an iota. He fought to the death until finally he was killed. When Midian was destroyed, he was destroyed with Midian. But how's it possible? So I always mention an allegory which is presented by Rav Chaim Vodoshana, which he writes, which is brought in the introduction to the Gers HaGroch. There's a letter the Vilna Gon had written to his family. The Vilna Gon always wanted to emigrate to Yerushalayim because he felt that if no Jew emigrates there, Mashiach is going to be put on hold. The quicker we get there, that will expedite the coming of Mashiach. So, he was going to leave his home. He was a man already in the 60s. And he wrote a letter to his family exactly how they have to conduct themselves without him being there. As long as he's there, they're under his tutelage. He's their example. But the moment he believes... They're all by themselves. So he gives them instructions exactly how the family has to live their lives, although he's not there. It's called the Igeris Agro. The letter is written by the Vilna Gold to his family. Ultimately, he never made it. He returned. Nobody understands why he returned. He never made it to Israel, the Vilna Gold. And he passed away in Vilna. That's what happened. So in the introduction to that letter, 
they cite an allegory from Rav Chaim Vavoshna, who was the primary student of Vilna Gaon. And he asked the question, how is it possible, Bilam being the quilt of Moshe Rabbeinu, as a prophet, how could he behave or misbehave the way he lived? He lived like a life like a person that God was not in his life. How is it possible? So he explains, explains it with an allegory. You have two species. You have a bat and you have an eagle. A bat doesn't have, is not able to see, has no eyes. But like you have sonar, is able, like the, the porpoises, the navy, they learn sonar from the porpoises. A bat has such sensitivity to light. It's so acute that the moment it senses any degree of light, it goes to the darkest recesses of a cave that it should not be exposed to light. That's a bat. But as much as it has a sensitivity, sensitivity to light, does it understand what light is? How can it understand what light is if it ne never saw light? Because it has no eyes. That's a bat. An eagle, no bird could soar as high as an eagle. It's the most powerful bird. And when the the speed that an eagle flies and the height that an eagle flies, when it swoops down, its eyes are able to see hundreds of miles into, in, into the distance. Why? Because based on the topography of the earth, of the land, the reflection of the sun, it's able to see things and make out things which no bird could make out. That's an eagle. Therefore, we say a person who has phenomenal eyesight we say he's eagle-eyed because he has that, that capacity of clarity. He sees so well. But does it have the sensitivity of a bat to light? Definitely not. The bat's sensitivity is so acute that at dawn, as it's about to approach, he's already escaping into some cave. The bat. Okay. I'm still recording. I'm just going to stop it for a moment. So, Bilam had a sensitivity to God's presence, the equivalent of Moshe's sensitivity, except the difference was 
The bat has no idea what light is. He knew God is whoever he is, but he was never able to internalize the reality of who he was. Moshe Rabbeinu is the eagle. He utilizes the light to magnify whatever is in, is in existence. So therefore, although we say, Lokam Novi Kemoshe, among Jews, there was no prophet as great as most that had clarity, but had an acute sensitivity. Bilam did not have the clarity, but he had that sensitivity. He knew exactly the moment when God becomes angry and he was going to curse the Jewish people during that period of time. And God withheld his anger during those moments that he should not destroy the Jewish people. But that was Bilam. That was Bilam. We've mentioned in Gemara many times that Paro had three advisors. Yisro, who was Moshe's father-in-law eventually. There was Eov, Job, and there was Bilam. The one who suggested and recommended the bondage that's the only way to control the Jews, that was Bilam's. That was his suggestion. Yisro was a statesman. He was the Sheikh of Midian. He was from the inner circle of Pyro's advisors. When he heard this, you realize the Jewish people are descendants of Yosef. Yosef was the vicer of Egypt. If not for Yosef, Egypt would have perished in the famine. He saved the day. So how could you take the family of the person who the existence of Egypt is only due to his providing what he provided to go and enslave an innocent people? How do you do such a thing? It's unconscionable. So what did Yisro do when he heard this suggestion? And Paro was buying into this. Borach, he fled. He cannot be exposed to this miscarriage of justice at any level. He fled. Eov, Job, Shosak. He remained silent. And because he remained silent, that's the reason why he suffered the way he suffered. Those were the trials and tribulations of Job. Hashem comes to Job, to Eov, and he says, after hearing such, a, such an unconscionable decree that the Jews are going to be enslaved, how do you remain silent? Yisro Borach fled. That was, his, that was his protest. But you, how did you remain? So Job said to Hashem, and if I would have fled, do you think it would have made a difference? It would have made a difference. Paro would have gone with Bilam's suggestion, enslaved these people. So what did I do? I remained silent. So Hashem says, Bilam, oh Job, I understand what you're saying. We're going to fast forward a little bit now. It says, Eov was a tzaddik. He had a phenomenal family. He had endless children, wealth, fame. Physically, he was fit and healthy. All of a sudden, an invading army comes, takes all his possessions. A hurricane wind comes, and his children are celebrating together. The house is toppled on them, and they're all killed. Literally, in a few swoops, he goes from the sun shining at a level where you can't even look at the rays of the sun goes into literally disaster. He loses everything. So what does he, Job say? Hashem nosa and Hashem lo. God gives, God takes. I have no, no, I have no claim against God. It's God's world. I accept it. Then he's not finished yet. He says to Satan. Sutton says, "What? What now?" He says. You could afflict him physically, his physical body. All of a sudden, he had his body started, his physicality started to fail. And he suffered tremendous pain. Besides losing everything, he says to Satan, I allow you to torture him up to the point that you don't take his son. He has to stay alive. Because the whole thing is to see if he can withstand the test. Okay. And he's writhing from pain and screaming from pain that he can't contain himself. Hashem comes to him. And he says, Job, why are you screaming? 
is why am I screaming? What I've been through and I'm experiencing, the pain, it's so overwhelming, all consuming. How do you not scream? So Hashem says to Bilam, listen to your own words. At one time I asked you a question. Why didn't you protest the decree against the Jews when Bilam suggested taking the innocent people and enslaving them? He said, because if I would have protested, it wouldn't have made a difference. It wouldn't have changed things. He would have followed Bilam's suggestion. And she said, so I said, I hear what you're saying. But now that you're suffering at this level, why are you screaming? Because you're in pain, which is uncontainable pain. So what is, what's the message? When it hurts, you scream. If it doesn't hurt, you don't scream. It's not the scream as the protest. How could have you not screamed? If taking innocent people and enslaving them the way Billam suggested to just ultimately destroy them, how do you not scream from pain? Evidently, you could live with it. Yisro couldn't take, couldn't tolerate it. He could not be within the proximity of this kind of misjustice, miscarriage of justice. He fled. But Bill, Yisro wanted you flee. Job wanted you flee. Or at least scream. Because when it hurts, you scream. There's a book that was written by the head of the history department at, at Harvard. His name is Goldhagen. He's a Jew. And the book is called Hitler's Willing Execu Execu Executioners. And he shows in that book, and it's recorded and documented. It's a phenomenal book that every German citizen was aware of how the Jews were being annihilated and being murdered without any level of man, women, children at an exaggerated level that if you were aware of it, it was something that was beyond the pale. Every German was aware of it. And they were, they were willing because they not they should have risen up and not allow it to happen. But they watched it and they were okay with it. How could you be okay with it? Some of them participated. Allowed, whether they informed on the Jew, didn't inform, but how do you sit by and watch this? Therefore, they are the willing executioners. They are no, they were accomplices to this genocide which Hitler brought about. The book is worthwhile reading. Read it many years ago. There's a story, and it was a known fact in the Holocaust Museum to have a cattle car. And if you go to Auschwitz, they have the cattle car on the on the on the tracks, on the railroad track. These cattle cars were used to transport Jews to Auschwitz and to other concentration camps. A cattle car, they would pack maybe three, four hundred people into the car, which had a capacity for maybe 20 people, 30 people. When that cattle car arrived at Auschwitz, these people were on the train for a few days. Many of the people, the elderly, they were no longer alive. Whether they starved, they were asphyxiated, infants, they died. So when they unloaded, unloaded them, and they had these vicious dogs, Doberman pinchers, they had German shepherds, and the Germans, they had whips, and they would whip the people as they got off the train, because they didn't move quick, quick enough. And they confiscated all their belongings, because they didn't realize where they were going. This is what happened. And the adjoining railroad car, cattle car, there was one cow being attended by a German soldier, feeding it, giving it water. You have three, four hundred Jews in one car and one cow in the other car. You understand? Okay, just to give you a little idea what's going on over here. After the war, when the American army liberated concentration camps. There's a book, it's worthwhile reading. It's called Lieutenant Birnbaum. He was a religious man. He was a, a lieutenant. And he was there when the camp was liberated, together with Eisenhower. 
Eisenhower, when he saw what took place in these camps, Eisenhower was a five-star general. What he saw, most people didn't see. This is something he never saw in his life. Never saw anything like it. This level of cruelty, this level of subhuman behavior, how you can take human beings and do turn them into skeletons and abuse them and reduce them to non-existence with that, not a, a trace of, of mercy, compassion. So what happened right after the war? He gave an order that whatever these people need, whatever they want, and the displacing persons camps. So, okay, what happens? When he came into the camp, bodies were piled 10 feet high, 12 feet high, and they were still warm because the Nazis, they went and they murdered, the, they could kill as many Jews as they can before they fled from the camps. But what they did was immediately, after they fled, they took off the German uniforms and they put on civilian dress so they should not be identified as being the ones in the concentration camp, the guards. And they mixed it among the civilian population. Okay? So this Lieutenant Birnbaum was in the camp and they put sentries, MPs, to protect the property after they were liberated because they felt people would start looting. And people would would have had to be controlled. And all of a sudden there's this man, a Jewish man, he looked like a skeleton. And his eyes had no life in them. And he has a bayonet in his hand. Not attached to a gun, just a bayonet. And he goes over to a person dressed in civilian dress and he takes the bayonet and he plunges it into the heart of this guy dressed in civilian garb. Kills him. As soon as he does that, the MP is ready to shoot this, this person. Because that's exactly what they have to prevent this kind of behavior. Lieutenant Berman says, leave him alone, he's a Jew. This person was an SS officer and he knew he was because he recognized him. He's the one who killed his family and tortured him. Okay, just to give you a little inkling. So what happened? So the Klosenberger Rebbe, Zechat Tzadik Levrocha, was in Auschwitz for eight, for eight, nine months. And he had a following of tens of thousands of Hasidim. All his Hasidim were murdered. His wife and 11 children were, were killed. And he was an inmate. And when Eisenhower came to the DP camp, it was Yom Kippur. And they're holding by the Elo. That's the closing service, the most holy service of Yom Kippur. And the Klosenberg Rebbe gives an order that all the people in the DP camps should put on their leather shoes, although it was Yom Kippur, out of respect for General Eisenhower. And Eisenhower needed a translator. The rabbi comes out and he sees this man he has a presence of holiness. And Eisenhower says to him, through this translator, through this Birnbaum, and somebody else, they could speak Yiddish. And he says, anything you Jews want, I'm willing to supply. You need prayer shawls, you need prayer books, you need holy books, whatever you need. We're flying in immediately with the transports. So he said to them, he said to them, we need ritual slaughter. And this, we have people here who are qualified to be ritual slaughterers. We want them to go to the slaughterhouses to be able to slaughter cows to provide meat. And we'll set up a kosher kitchen. Eisenhower has no problem. He gathers the German citizenry and he says to them, the Jews are going to go into your slaughterhouse and they're going to slaughter animals to provide meat for the Jews. Kosher meat. So the head of the slaughterhouse says, but how could you do that? It's inhumane. Yeah? This is what he says to, to, to Eisenhower. It's inhumane. Eisenhower just witnessed piles of bodies piled 10, 12 feet high, recently murdered. And he says, inhumane. He was really, he was ready to strangle this guy with his own hands. This is the, the level of subhumanity that these people were. And immediately, 
they instituted what we call shechita in these slaughterhouses, ritual slaughter. Then there's a question of burying the dead. He had all these bodies that had to be buried, otherwise there'd be disease. And they didn't have backhoes to dig graves. As these German Yamach Shimonikas, they had the Jews dig mass graves and they machine gunned them into the graves. Eisner gave an order. All these Germans, they better start digging graves to bury the Jewish dead. So they, as much as they didn't like it, they had no choice. They started to dig graves. Mass graves, so these bodies who were desecrated by these Germans were tortured and starved. They were interred in the graves. Of course, the one who put them in the grave were Jews. But the one who dug the grave were these people. This is what we're talking about. Could you imagine? It's inhumane. He says to, to Eov, after hearing the decree that an innocent people, who these people owe their existence to their their, their antecedent, to Yosef, the viceroy, you're going to torture and enslave an innocent people. How could you listen to this and witness it and not scream out of pain? The answer is you're not pained. Not pained. Let's fast forward. October 7th. There was a massacre over there. An inhumanity displayed. Initially, the world was take, was shocked. People killed. Innocent people. people. Women raped. Little children being burnt alive by these barbarians. A few days pass. No problem. The world court in The Hague is condemning Jew Jews for what? For crime against whatever it is. Netanyahu now has become a criminal. He's been criminalized by the, the Hague, the world court. The Jews are this and the Jews are that. Protests. How, how, do, you even, how do you process it? After seeing what they are and what they did. And you can't live with them. Under any circumstance, how do you justify this kind of behavior? But somehow the world, Europe, European anti-Semitism is like pre-World War anti-Semitism. In the United States, there's never been anti-Semitism like this. It's filtered into, into American society. It's intolerable, but somehow they're able to eat it and swallow it without a problem. I say... We're not too far off from the end when the Sheikh will come. There's going to be a day of judgment. There's going to be a day of reckoning. And God said, I gave you every opportunity to see it right. And if you could sit by and remain silent, but not only remain silent, to condone and give right to these people, there's no defense. You people are going straight into the oblivion. I gave you every opportunity to see it right. And you couldn't have seen it more wrong than you saw it. That's the reality of the world today. You know, the Midrash tells us the world was destroyed during the Great Flood. Why? Because the world was evil. He saw the world was corrupted and evil. God says, I will destroy this world. So the Midrash asks, after the Great Flood, fast forward history, the level of evil that existed during the Great Flood, does it still exist? That's the question Medjur asks. Medjur says definitely yes. So why doesn't God destroy the world? Because there aren't as many people as evil as them. That's the only reason. But the intensity of that evil still exists. There are those kind of people around. They're fomenting the anti-Semitism. They're stoking those coals. And when people are ready to be influenced and they're open to it, they get ignited and they take up the course. That's what it's about. The Gemara tells us in Gitten, and this is a Gemara we study on, on Tisha B'Av. On Tisha B'Av, you're not supposed to study subject matter which brings joy. So we speak about the tragedies that took place in our history. Destruction of the first and second temple, 
the laws that pertain to mourning, to grieving, and the story of the destruction of the second temple. Who destroyed the second temple? Titus. In Hebrew, it's known as Titus. Titus. There's the Arch of Titus in Rome. Titus, after he destroyed the temple, and he took back spoils from Yerushalayim, from the temple, he was on a, a large boat going back to Rome. As he's on this boat, there's a storm, and the boat is about to, to capsize and sink with Titus on it. Titus himself was an arrogant, you can't imagine his level of arrogance, what kind of bad guy he was. He personified evil. He epitomized what Asaph was, what Esau is. And he looks towards heaven, he says, God, sure, you destroyed the Egyptians at the sea. Now I'm on the ocean, you destroy me on the ocean. If you come out to dry land, I'll fight you. Because he, he believed he was a deity. I'll fight you tooth and nail. All of a sudden, the storm subsides. He lands in Rome with all his glory, all the pomp. As soon as he leaves the ship, a tiny insect goes into his nostril and goes into his brain. Yeah, I'm telling you what, the, what exactly verbatim the Talmud. And it starts gnawing at his brain. And no doctor is able to remedy his problem. And he can't tolerate the pain. He keeps gnawing and it's eating at his brain. It's like, you know, mad cow disease. I don't know, whatever it is. person has cancer of the brain. This insect is gnawing at his brain. And one day he's walking down the street and there's a blacksmith hammering with his sledgehammer on the anvil. And all of a sudden, the noise of the hammer hitting the anvil startles this insect, stops gnawing his brain. So what does he do? He realizes that's a way to deal with the problem, the issue. So he gets a Jew, that this Jew should hammer all day long, and by, as a result of that, the, this insect will gnaw at his brain. And he says to the Jew, he says, you know, you Jew, I really shouldn't give you anything but I'm going to throw you a crumb because you're really offering me a service. But you really even don't deserve that. So I'm not going to even pay you what I would pay a Gentile. What happens? The insect gets used to the noise. And he gets used to the noise. Back again. Insect starts gnawing at his brain again. Until finally he dies. When he realized that he was dying, he was going to die, he gives an order that after he dies, he wants to be cremated and they should take his ashes and spread them over the seven seas of the world. Why? Because after he dies, God is going to take retribution against him. So by incinerating, cremating him, spreading over the seven seas, God's not going to be able to locate his remains. Yeah, this is what he said. So they followed his order. They cremated him, spread his ashes over the seven seas. Okay. There was a great Jew, his name was Unculus, Unculus Hager, Unculus the convert. He wanted to convert, and Unculus Hager was a nephew of Nero, the Roman emperor. And before he converted, he wanted to consult with some of the people who the history was, they weren't good people. And he goes and he raises Titus from spiritual hell, and he consults with him. So he says to Titus, by the way, what, what, what's going on down there? How are you faring? He says, I'll tell you what they do to me every day. Every day, they gather my ashes from the seven seas, they reconstruct me as a human being, and then they, they cremate me, they incinerate me every day. And we undergo this process every day. And the leveling of suffering is beyond one's understanding the way I suffer. So he says, I want to ask you a question. Is it worthwhile to convert to Judaism? What do you suggest? He says, not only is it not worthwhile, whatever you could do to hurt the Jews, hurt the Jews. You hear this? The man is burning in hell. He's experiencing the worst due to who he was. 
but he still doesn't get it. He's like so addic addicted to evil, even in a set of, of suffering, he cannot tolerate the Jew, what the Jew represents. Whatever you could do, just hurt them. Okay? He raises another person from hell. Who is this? Bilam. Bilam, the prophet of the nations. And he says, how are you fearing down there? How are you, how are you doing? So he says, I'll tell you my predicament. We find at the end of the later that he failed in his mission. He couldn't curse the Jews. God didn't allow him. But he said to Bullock, the God of the Jews will not tolerate licentiousness, promiscuity. He would snare the Jews with the Moabite women. And if they engage sexually, God will wipe them out. And 40,000 Jews died in the plague because of that. And we would have all been destroyed if not for Pinchas is eligible. So he, he said, you know what they do to me every day? They have large vats of semen. They cook me in semen all day long. So he, so he says, should I convert? He says, I'll give you advice. Don't convert, but stay away from the Jews. Because if you start up with them, they're going to give you a lot of trouble. Just stay away. It wasn't as extreme as what Titus said. Finally, who does he raise from hell? We call Yoshka Pandrik, JC. He raises him, and he's burning down there too. The fa father of Christianity. And he says to them, What's happening? So he tells them he's being punished, whatever it is. They're feeding him humid feces. You hear this? Human feces. Why human feces? Because the Morris cites a verse that if you make a mockery of, of Torah, Judaism, ultimately you can eat feces. And because he did that, he says, what do you think? Should I convert? He says, there's no bet. If you have the opportunity to convert, you definitely should convert. They become a Jew. And that was the end of the story. And Uncle has been converted. So a person who lived a life of evil even in hell, it becomes so intermingled and intermeshed in his soul, he can't behave differently than he behaved in this world, although he no, no, no longer has an evil inclination. He's become that, and that's the reality. And these people go into the oblivion eventually. Eventually, their souls are going to be destroyed and turned into nothing at the end of time, when God will recreate existence and there'll be a full resurrection, and whoever is meant to be there will be part of eternity, these people will no longer exist. Okay, we'll end here. And if there are any comments... I'm